So thank you for having me, guys. And um, Peter was like, we couldn't have been a better tag team if we tried. So you've really got me, set me up here, Peter. So thank you very much. I think what I'm going to talk about is actually stages seven, eight, nine, yeah. ten that Peter talked about. And the next stage, if you like, of the fantastic work that Balfour Beatty have done, as in what we can do next. And actually, we're working with Balfour Beatty at the moment on, on exactly this, as well as other contractors like Skanska and BAM and Wilma Dixon and others. So let me go through my presentation. Quickly fly through this. Why did I leave BRE? I left BRE, as Guy said, um, to join Co Builder. Um, because they're busy, if you like, helping the industry in Norway. As we know, Norway is often a bit of a leader in all things BIM, and they're really helping deliver as-built information from manufacturers, which I'll come on to in a bit. So how do we take the data from the manufacturers and then deliver it right through the supply chain to actually get it to the um, contractors and then the asset managers? And they've been working with many people, and nearly everyone in Norway uses their systems, and they wanted to come to the UK, so I thought it was great to bring it here. So here I am. So, I designed this. Looks lovely. I used all my uh, IFC and CAD and Revit or um, <coughs> Archicad or whatever else, and I used the BIM objects. Looks lovely. And I got this. Toby Carl, or, or Lyle, I think the, the chap on the right is, I think he's used a lot. Um, now, that's a joke, obviously, um, but the point here is so often in the industry, we're fantastic at designing now and designing in BIM, and I think the industry's really, really moved on. And then what Peter's just shown you is the next phase, I think, the next iteration of where we're going in terms of getting data. But so often, the Bryce Norton case study was good, but, but that's one in, in few, and so often what we receive is good old Kobe Carl, but we get this. We get PDFs on disks and PDFs in paper. And even there, for instance, sometimes the information you get is just literally a brochure. And this isn't being overly negative. I'm just saying this is the fact. This is what we receive at the moment. We receive an O&M manual, which is based on these two things. And this is what I get day in, day out. So if I'm the facilities manager, and I want to know what's in my building, and I want to replace a product, what do I do? I can't find it. And that's why the, the journey that we're on with BIM, one of the big opportunities with BIM, is about understanding the information, understanding the products that we're putting into our buildings. And then we saw that, and that's the good reason, if you like, for the use of Kobe, because we're now starting to get some actual data about the products. <coughs> so BIM, as we all, I'm sure you all know this, Better Information Management, I think, to Nick from Mervyn, standing over there, is the better acronym of BIM. But it's about the as-built information model that's key. And that is the graphical information, as we've heard. The documents, we forget this, the PDFs are important, but also the data. And it's the combination of all three that makes the as-built information model. And that's what we really need to be delivering, and delivering to our clients and our facilities managers. And that's what I'm going to talk about. So, a building. The building, or the infrastructure, not just buildings here, but infrastructure as well, tied with tunnels, is made up of objects, in effect. They're all put together, and we have our building. And that's, if you like, what you would have heard as the DNA of a building. So, on that DNA and of those products, what information do you want to help you manage your asset? Manage the building. What information do you need to collect? Now, Peter mentioned the seven that, I would say, is the most basic, basic levels of data you'd need. Because that's usually just general O&M or CAFM data, a serial number, a warranty number. That's okay, but that's not BIM, that's just standard CAFM world. What we need to do now is raise that. It's okay to start getting that information, but we need to raise that information of what do we need to design, build, and manage the asset better. And that could be, for instance, well, obviously you need to contract you need to, uh, um, a handover, but what about the environmental guys? When they're doing green, for instance, they might need global warming potential, or they might want other specific data. Now, anyone who's done green would know the hassle of actually getting that information and getting <coughs> the data. So your environmental guys want data. What about your health and safety guys? Kosh, safety data sheets, nasty chemicals, 
things that should be in the building or not in the building or the infrastructure. I need information and data on that. Specifiers obviously need data. And there's an operation and maintenance requirements. And also there's a load of other data and useful information that manufacturers have. They have hundreds and hundreds of properties about their products. They don't just have six or seven, they have hundreds. And out of those hundreds, what of that data is interesting and important to help me build my building or infrastructure and then manage it effectively? So we were lucky to work with Ministry of Justice, and I hope you don't mind me just sharing some of this information, Matt, I'm not going to any specific detail. But what we worked with MOJ with, as well as the other team, is to say, what is the data that they require? So it's not just those seven, as we have mentioned, things like thermal transmittance, slip resistance, security <coughs> rating, acoustic rating. This is all data that they want, the Ministry of Justice want. Not for every product, but for certain products. And this is data that they want at certain stages in the design. When do they need what work packages? Do they need to start collecting this data? And so what we've worked with them on is to understand the minimum data requirements, which Matt showed earlier. That they can go out there to, their, to their, all their supply chain and say, guys, you work on an MOJ project, this is the minimum type of stuff we want on these products. Yes, we want a serial <coughs> number and warranty number, but we also want on, on a fire door, we want to know the fire rating of the fire door. Or I want the global warming potential of the concrete, or etc., etc. You can think of it yourself. So it's important for clients and for main contractors to work out what are the data requirements that they will need to help them in the building and management of the process. So where do we get this data from? Well, at the moment in time, jokingly I showed the, the information, but that's what an OM manual gives you. It's not the right, it comes to that in a minute, it's the left. There's a load of PDFs. When I ask for OM manuals, that's what I get. I shed loads of PDFs. And within those PDFs are a lot of data. But they're hidden, they're not live, they're not accessible, they're paper. How do we then help the Ministry of Justice and others Get the data out, free it if you like, free the data so that we can actually use it and utilise this data. Now at the moment in time, the state of the art is that and that. Now that, as we've heard mentioned, is on site then using things like BIM360 or Render or whoever, whoever packages, they can go on site and you can get someone to say, yeah, this is this product and this is the serial number, this is the warranty number. That's useful for CAFM tools. But that doesn't help me with all this nice information sitting here. So how are we going to get this information, the on-site stuff, and how are we going to get all that lovely data that we might use to help us manage the building and construct it better? And the answer, as we see it, is from the manufacturers. One route is you take the data directly from the PDFs. So you can sit there, we talked about earlier, you can give someone a template and say, fill in this information. I need the fire rating, I need the U-value, I want the flow rate. And you can give them a template and say, fill it in. And that can go to the... That can go then to the subcontractors. And lots of people are doing this, and that is a way of doing it. But I'm a little bit dubious of the quality of the information you'll get back. Though the real way of doing it is to actually get the information from the manufacturers. They're the ones who know about their products. So, <coughs> BIMify, nice made up word by me, but how do we make the manufacturers BIMify their data? It's not about objects. 3D objects, so I'm working with Skanska at the moment, and Skanska say, don't send me a 3D objects. We don't want them. They're fine for design, but for a contractor, we don't want them. We want your data. And they're doing the same thing as MOJ and saying, these are our minimum data requirements. Now, we're working with the manufacturers who work with, the major manufacturers that work with Skanska, to work out what data they require. Then this will go out to all their supply chain about that data. Then they will supply the data via tools like GoBIM, which is the co-builder tool, to Skanska so they can then pick the data the way they require when they require it from the manufacturers and therefore get better quality information. So that all comes via product data template. And we've heard that mentioned. PDT is just basically a master PDT. It's all the type of data a manufacturer could share. And you say it's nothing new. It's all in their, um, their, it's all in the PDFs already. But one thing I say about the product data template, it needs to be based on standards. And then we need to have an ability of bespoking it. In other words, from, the, from, the, from a project by project basis, based on the EIR or the AIR or the client, what data do you actually require from all this information? So it's not just a dump, here you are, here's my Excel sheet of all my data. 
We need to have it so that somebody, the client, can come in and say, this is, I want the fire rate and the U value, and then extract that data from the PDT or the PDS, the product data sheet. That's the tool that Dogen, that we've got, allows the, them to do. But the other point then with the data that the manufacturer makes available, it's got to be interoperable. There's no point me calling it one thing and saying it in English. What use is that to many people? Because, or taking the, maybe, take, maybe I'll come to this slide earlier, later, sorry. Because that needs to be available in IFC, it needs to be maybe available in Revit, it needs to be available in ARCAD, it needs to be available in Bentley, it might need to be available in German, it might need to be in French. They're all languages. So we need to make sure that this information is interoperable and we get this information. That's something we use the Building Smart Data Dictionary to help us do that, to make all this data interoperable. And we do that then to help the supply chain get the data, the manufacturers to share their data in an interoperable format. So that people from Chem come then, their clients, select the data they need in the format they need it in. So sorry, you can't quite see this. So what we're working with those manufacturers on then is actually to create their product data templates. And in those product data templates then, they will have all the properties they want to share with their, with their customers, but they can then also then make them interoperable. So make it available in Revit, make it available in German, make it available in Archicad, make it available in all these things so that it's all there, all available, and their clients can then come and select those properties and values and formats they require them in. And then they can export it. Again, sorry, this doesn't show it very well. As their own, if you like, bespoke required product data sheet. That says all the properties on that project they're interested in. So it could be building a prison, for instance, Related to that product, this is the data, and this is the standard it's against. And this data then can now be attributed to that individual project. So we've basically gone to the manufacturer, collected the data we need, put it in a format we want it in, and now we can use that data. So as I mentioned, the interoperability problem is that there is a load of different classifications out there, loads of different names, loads of different softwares out there, loads of different languages, and how do we make the data, don't just keep making it in all these different formats, make it available once, use the Building Smart Data Dictionary to map them for the terms, we do that, and then so the data is available from the manufacturers so that the clients, the contractors, and the designers can then select the data they require. So the process that we work on with a lot of the key big contractors, is to collect this information, make it structured as product data sheets based on the EIR, the AIR, or their minimum data requirements. What data do they need? So we make the product data sheet. Now this is really vital. Now we've got the data, we can now validate it. So you might validate the data in terms of its accuracy in something like Kobe and design stage, but what about the actual products you've installed? How do you know what they are? And how do you know they meet your design requirements? How do I know my window's got the right U-value or my fire rating's got the right you know, uh, two-hour fire door or three-hour fire door? Well, because we've collected the data directly from the manufacturer or we've extracted it out of the PDF, we've now got this as data. So we put rules into the system for the project to check. Is it the right green level rating, ABC? Is it the right fire door? Is it the right U-value? And we can validate now we've actually got the right products. And now we've got that, they can then be exported out into, attached to the model. So attached into an IFC, or put into a Navisworks, or, or Archicad, or whatever, Bentley, or whatever else. So the process is now, instead of waiting to the end, you get designs, you might have a nice model, you might have IFC, you might have Kobe. Instead of waiting to the end to make an O&M manual, just collect all this information by going through the supply chain, saying, what it did I build? And scrabbling around for a load of PDFs we can start collecting the information as it's being procured and installed. Because we know what we've bought, we know what we've procured, we can take the information from the manufacturers and take the data, and then we build up the as-built model. So that when we hand it over to the client and the facilities manager, we actually hand them over. Here's the model, and here's all the data, here's all the products you've installed, and all the data you've asked for within your data requirements, which it should be in the EIR or the AIR. So then we have, again, sorry, it's not coming out well. This is the, the, if you like, the repository of all the information for that project then. For this school project here would be the repository of all the PDFs and all the data sheets based on your data requirements sitting there for that project. And then it validated and checked. 
So finally, what you do then to deliver the as-built model is using uh, the plugin we have, again, for ARCHICAD, Navis, um, and IFC, or Revit, etc., etc. Go back and attach to the individual project where you've collected all this information with the Project Exchange. And then you can now tag the actual products into the model. So you've not just got a generic model, you've now got a model with the data attributed to it based on the data requirements that you were set in your EIR or AIR. So I've opened it up, I found the product that I want, a Vika window for instance here, I've now linked into, this is it, Revit, a, the Vika window itself, so I can now actually look at the data about that Vika window, Vika window based on my needs. And the same can be showed here, again it's not coming out well, here, for instance, in the model, I've attributed a Wiener Burger product into the model because that's what was purchased. This isn't designed, this is as built. I've purchased the Wiener Burger product. The data I required is here. So again, this is the data that's been asked for. So now I can see the model and I've got the as built data about the actual product in the model. Not design product, the actual product. With then, from there, you can obviously do the Kobe export out of IFC or out of various other ones, I want to see which is better than other. But you can actually now export out that data as the actual data about the product that's now been installed. And here's your Kobe export. And it's not just the basic information like warranty and the seven pieces of information, as Peter said, it's actually extra stuff based on the stuff you need. Solar factor, air permeability, whatever the data you need on that window. So just to finish, a bit ahead of time. Um, Make sure data is easy. This is for manufacturers. I don't know how many manufacturers are here. Hands up if there's a manufacturer. One. Oof, it's a shame. So I'm preaching to one, and I know you're converted. So I can preach to the converted, Paul. I'll tell you what you already know. Make sure your data is easily accessible. Interoperability is key. Delight your customers, showing that you can get this information. Provide them with the most up-to-date data. In other words, who knows their data best? A manufacturer knows their data best, not someone else. They can control it, they can share it. And let the facilities manager be able to go and find your data again. So if something breaks, if a light goes, they don't have to go through a load of O&M files and try to work it out. They can actually click on the model and see if the Philips, da 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 da, bought on the 26th of February at Jusons, and they can go and order another one. So this is the building blocks of BIM Level 3. Without this basic stuff, there is no BIM Level 3. Because you've got to know what your products are and what they're made of. There's no point doing fancy telemetry without the building blocks. So this is the building blocks, the information. And now you as a manufacturer get all this market intelligence because you know who's actually purchasing your products and where they're being used. And finally, for contractors, as we all know, needs to get clear data requirements up front. I know it's hard, but this is what we need to do. We need to push our um, clients to say, guys, what data do you need? And this is where like, the MOJ is really leading the field because they're telling people this is the data we need. And then it's easier then to then say, how are we going to start collecting it? Have a clear plan through design, but through construction to hand over of that data. How are we going to, as I showed, how are we going to collect all this information and hand it over? Now, obviously, I'd love you all to use go bin for the man to get the manufacturer's data and product exchange to collate it all. And there are uh, plugins to then distribute it to the model. That's obviously one way. And obviously now we need to focus not just on the design, validated quality in the design model, again like another plug for Salibri. We can now design, we can now validate the data of the as built. Make sure we've actually got what we wanted, which wouldn't be nice because we don't often used to doing that. So that's me. Um, I hope that's given you an insight into where we're going. We say we're busy working now and taking this forward with quite a few clients and big contractors and manufacturers. And the more people who want to get on the journey with us are doing the building blocks of data ready for BIM level three and getting level BIM level two right first. We'd love to speak to you. Thank you. Thank you.